If you listen really closely, whenever his right foot makes contact with the treadmill, you'll hear a louder slap. And that's because he doesn't have the muscles in his leg to control that descent of his foot to making contact with the treadmill. So you get in this video, I'm gonna share my reactions and some additional insight into what we saw during Project 11, the inspiring and just really well done documentary about Alex Smith's injury and his subsequent rehab. If you're new to this page, I'm a doctor and a sports fan, and it's my goal here to provide some additional medical insight on what we see in the world of sports. I'm gonna step chronologically through this and just touch on some additional educational points that I think would be interesting for everybody to learn about. Don't worry, I will warn you before showing some of the photos, but I still think there's a lot that we can learn from them. So I wanna start right off with the actual injury play itself, because there's something interesting about what the medical staff is doing out here on the field. So if you watch them here, what they're doing is it looks like they're basically pumping something up or inflating something with air. What they're actually doing there is removing air from something called a vacuum splint. So a vacuum splint is filled with these little plastic kind of styrofoam beads. And whenever it's not vacuumed out of air, you can basically wrap it around the leg or the arm and form it to the shape that you want to sort of fully enclose and protect the injured limb. You then suck the air out like we see them doing here in this photo, and when it pulls the air out, it basically makes it go really rigid and firm so that it's now like a rigid solid cast to provide protection to transport to the hospital for further treatment. Next, we get to the actual x-rays of Alex's injury. If we look here, we can see the tibia here on the right side of the screen and the fibula here on the left. The fibula is on the lateral or outer portion of the leg. And this portion of the fibula down here is likely what was coming out of the skin. Remember, this was a compound fracture, meaning that the bone broke through the skin. The skin was opened. The other thing they mentioned was how this is a spiral fracture. And that's basically just what it sounds like. The fracture pattern spirals up around the bone. As they mentioned, this typically occurs when there's some torque or twisting of the bone because it's that twisting that causes that stress to spiral up the bone. Bones aren't very strong in torsion. They're pretty strong with compression when we just load them from one end to the other, but they're fairly weak with torsion. And if we look at the original play, this is what we saw happen that caused Alex to have the fracture. But we get to see this really cool reconstructed image here. Basically what they do is they take oftentimes a CT scan and form this 3D reconstruction where we can see just the severity of that fracture pattern where it's going literally like almost all the way up to the knee up here. Next up, we saw the actual fracture repair with the hardware, the plates and the screws. Now, a lot of the other tibia fractures that we've seen in professional athletes end up with something just called intramedullary nailing or an intramedullary rod. And as we heard, Alex ultimately had this done as his sort of definitive stabilization of the fracture. But other players like Paul George, like we saw with UFC fighter Anderson Silva, Kevin Ware, initially had just an intramedullary nail. But in this case, because of how significant the fracture was with how high up it extended the tibia, the number of sort of pieces of bone that were displaced away, the surgeons had to do what we would call plate and screw fixation. So what we see here along the edges of the bone are rigid metal plates. And then these are all screws or pins basically securing that plate to the bone. And then our first post-surgical picture, things really don't look too bad. This all looks like natural healing and what we would see after this significant of a surgery. We've got all of our different surgical incisions that have been sutured up to allow for all the different locations of the pinning, the placements of the surgical plates. And all of this looks pretty good and normal as they said in the video, but as we know, things unfortunately took a bad turn. Now this is where I'm gonna show some of the other photos. So Keep that in mind if you don't want to see them, but I think we can learn a lot by taking an educational look through what each of them show. Just a couple days after his surgery, Alex's leg now looked like this. Now we learned he had something called necrotizing fasciitis. Necrotizing meaning death and fasciitis, talking about inflammation and infection within the fascial tissue underneath the skin and within the muscle. If we look at this photo, this black area is all dead tissue. This is all tissue that's not going to recover and heal on its own. But other signs of infection that we can see here is the general swelling that we see. This is what we call erythema or the redness that we can see around the outside of the image. And if we look back at his initial procedure, you can tell there really isn't that much redness or swelling around this area compared to now looking at what he had a couple days afterwards with the infection and we see all this substantial redness in that area. 
One thing we'll actually do in the hospital when taking care of these patients is we'll actually take a marker and draw on the skin, kind of outlining the area of erythema or redness. So that way the next morning we can come in and we can look and see if that redness has expanded beyond our line or has started to recede. It's a simple little easy trick, but it's one of the best ways in order to objectively just look at something that is red and possibly infected and know if it's, it's getting worse or if it's starting to get better. So anytime we have an infection like this, obviously we wanna to try to give antibiotics through a vein to treat and kill off those bacteria that are causing the infection. But with something this severe, we have to do what's called debridement, where we, the surgeons actually go in and cut away the dead infected tissue. The problem is that dead tissue is not gonna heal and it just becomes a source for that continued infection to brew and spread further and further up the leg to where now you involve more tissue. So then we took off and we saw some of the photos of the subsequent debridements that he underwent. But here we can now see that those fluid filled pockets, those blisters are gone. We can see some of the underlying skin. And in this case, that pink color that we see is good. That pink color tells us that there's some healthy tissue there that is hopefully viable that can heal and recover. But when we see these other kind of darker areas that look a little dusky, a little bit gray and dark, that's a sign to us that there could be some dead tissue under there. And we can see some additional spots like right here. There's a lot of dark kind of gray dusky tissue there. We can see some more kind of here around some of these incisions. So we can see here that there is still more tissue that has to be taken out. And you really just have to keep taking out that tissue until it's gone. This next photo is when things really started to become a lot more serious with the amount of tissue that they had to actually take. We can still see this kind of dark black area, and this looks to be on top of one of the muscles that we would later find out had to be removed, a muscle called the anterior tibialis, the muscle that picks up or dorsiflexes your foot. But what they're basically doing here with this incision is they're trying to get up in there and clean away all that dead necrotic tissue that could be causing and kind of provoking that infection. Moving on here, we can see some more of his anatomy and just the extent of this infection. So here we can actually see that plate and this is the inside of his leg. So this would be one of the plates on his tibia. But this muscle that we can see right up top here is his anterior tibialis. And if you look in the middle, you can tell how there's a lot of just gray, dusky looking muscle and that's dead damaged muscle that is not going to recover on its own. So that's why they talked about in the video having to basically take all of that muscle out of his anterior compartment. We can divide the lower and upper leg into compartments and the anterior compartment muscles are predominantly responsible for dorsiflexion of the foot. It's whenever we walk or run, it's the muscles that help pick our foot up so that we don't fall and trip by catching our toes. This last picture now, we can see that even more tissue has had to be removed from his leg because of the infection. This white area here is where the muscle has started to evolve into the tendon that's gonna go down and insert on the bone. But now we can see even another plate there on the tibia. But the nice thing is this is finally good viable, healthy looking tissue. It certainly looks bad probably to a lot of people who haven't seen this before, but this is the appearance of good, healthy tissue that tells you that you've kind of gotten, hopefully all that infected necrotic tissue out of the leg. So once you've done all that debridement and are going on to these limb salvaging procedures, there's a lot of skin grafting. There's a lot of muscle moving like they talked about with his calf muscle and a part of his quad muscle. So you can't just do all that and then close it back up like you did before. That's where these external fixation devices really come into play because it allows you to have more access to the skin, to the soft tissues in case you need to do more procedures or do more skin grafting. So we can see here on this x-ray image of his external fixation device that there's still some pins in the bone, but those plates have been removed because potentially those plates could be a source of infection. So you take those plates out. The external fixation device provides that fixation and rigidity to the bones to allow them to heal, but does it in a way that's on the outside of the body. So it's external fixation. It's tough to see on this picture, but they were talking about how they wanted to see bridging of bone. And whenever bone heals, you initially get this callus that forms that kind of bridges the broken space. And so if we look closely in here, you can see how there's a little bit kind of different shade of color there that tells us that the bone is starting to bridge in that area which was of course the good sign that then said he could have this device taken off. And then they put in that intramedullary nail or rod into his tibia 
for more definitive stabilization while the bone completed its healing process. There were a lot of scenes in here where we could see Alex's upper legs and you could tell there was like a red streak on them. Those are the sites where they took skin in order to do skin grafts down on his injured leg. There's two main options that they'll use for skin grafting, either split thickness or full thickness skin grafts. Essentially a full thickness skin graft involves taking the epidermis and all of the dermis, whereas a split thickness skin graft involves taking just the epidermis with a little bit of the dermis below it. But what they'll do is they have this tool, they scrape it along the skin in the thigh in this case, and what it does is it cuts off almost like a deli meat slicer, it cuts off that layer of skin that they want to harvest elsewhere. What they'll do in order to take that smaller patch of skin and expand it over a bigger area is they'll then run that piece of skin through a machine that pokes little tiny holes in it. So that then allows them to take that piece of skin and stretch it and spread it out over a bigger area. So there's some of these pictures too where you can actually look on his injured leg and you can see kind of little holes in the portions where they grafted the skin, that's because they punch holes in that piece of skin that allows them to stretch it and then cover more area without having to take more from the donor side up on his thigh. But that's what these red streaks are that we see on his thighs as he's in his different healing stages throughout the show. As we're getting into Alex's rehab here, one of the things I noticed is he's taking advantage of something called blood flow restriction training. So here, as he takes this band off of his leg, Basically what that is, is a compression band that's wrapped around the leg above the site of the muscles you want to activate. It's then pumped up like a blood pressure cuff. And what this does is it occludes the venous blood flow. So that's the blood that's coming from down lower in the foot, coming back up the leg, eventually to the heart, partially occludes the arterial blood flow going down to the foot. But what it basically allows you to do is get the same kind of metabolic kind of muscle growth and muscle work without having to exert a higher amount of energy. So you often hear about it used with weightlifters trying to build muscle and gain hypertrophy, but it's also used in rehab settings because after some type of injury, oftentimes patients don't have the ability to fully load their joints in order to get that muscle to the appropriate level of work to start growing. So blood flow restriction training basically lets them apply a lower workload to get the same benefit as if they weren't injured and they were able to push themselves more. So it's a nice little trick that allows someone like Alex to get the same benefit of working his muscles without having to give kind of that full exertion because of the limitations from his leg injury. Finally here, the big question people wanna know is, can he play football again? There's nothing about his injury that's what we would call an absolute contraindication, meaning he would never be able to play again no matter what. What it all comes down to is functionally just what he's able to do. Remember, they took all of that muscle out of his leg that helps to pick his foot up whenever he walks and runs. We've seen other athletes with similar to what we would call foot drop where they can't pick the foot up as well. For example, Michael Porter Jr. is well known and wears a brace in the NBA to help with foot drop, but for a quarterback to come back and play with foot drop like this would be pretty unprecedented. Another little clue about what we would call foot drop where he can't pick his foot up is whenever he's running on the treadmill here in one of the final scenes, he has something that we call foot slap. If you listen really closely, whenever his right foot makes contact with the treadmill, you'll hear a louder slap. And that's because he doesn't have the muscles in his leg to control that descent of his foot to making contact with the treadmill. So you get this slappage gait where every step it's slap, slap. And if you listen here, you can hear the difference between the two feet. I'll play that again. So it's not my place at all to say whether or not he can play again. It certainly will be extremely tough and very hard to do and something nobody else has ever done before. But he certainly seems motivated and so more credit to him for trying to have these goals and really trying to work through them. To finish up here, I want to especially thank Alex and the ESPN team and Stefania Bell for putting this on. It's great to see something so inspiring and just motivational for other athletes who are going to be going through really tough, challenging injuries. It's not often that we get this detailed of a look at this process. And so I really am appreciative to them for sharing all of this that 
has undoubtedly been a very difficult and hard journey for him and his family and friends to all go through. I hope by making this video, I'm helping to fulfill his original purpose of trying to spread some education and awareness about this and give you guys some additional insights about this whole process and some of the things I noticed as a doctor watching this documentary. That's it for the video. Thank you as always for watching everybody. Let me know any questions or comments below and I'll see you in the next one.